Okay, and I'd like to welcome everybody to number 93 of the Circle of Rhine Writers Let's Talk About Sessions. These sessions started during COVID, and today's session is Let's Talk About Ice Wine, its future in a changing in a changing climate with Michelle Bouffard and Professor Monica Chrisman. I'd like to extend a welcome to those members that are non-members of the circle um, who have joined us today, and it's their first time. The Circle of Wine Writers was founded in 1960 and today has 260 members, 50% uh, in the UK and the rest around the world. Um, comprising of wine writers, broadcasters, educators and other professional communicators. You can find more about the Circle and its members on our website. And if you have uh, interested in joining, there's also the joining criteria there. For any other information, then please do email me. My email address is on the website. But before I continue, I'd now like to hand over to Meg, our Honorary Secretary, who's based in New Hampshire, who will introduce our speakers today. Over to you, Meg. Great. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're really thrilled to have the WSET Diploma students join us as well. It's really great to, to know that there are people with this interest in this really interesting and rich subject. Um, ice wine or ice vine, uh, is it under threat from climate change? I don't know, and we're none of us except the two experts in this room really know, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from them on this subject. Um, Michelle Buffar is a wine author, journalist, speaker, educator, and consultant. Um, in 2017, she founded Tasting Climate Change, which is an international symposium that explores the challenges and solutions of climate change in the wine industry. Um, she lives in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and teaches WSET courses and she also offers training uh, for European and New World wine regions. Um, she's also a certified sommelier. Uh, Professor Monica Christman is head of enology at Hochschule Geisenheim University, and she's the former president of the Organization for Vine and Wine, or we know it probably better as OIV. Um, and her research, uh, really a major research focus for her is assessing the risks of climate change in the wine industry. She's the author of numerous treatises on wine um, and she wine research and technology, and she contrib contributes uh, continuing professional training programs internationally as well. So we have two people from two very important ice wine regions, also experts in climate change, also experts in wine, to tell us about this topic today. Thank you very much. And I think Michelle is going to take it from the top. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Megan. And it's great to be here. Um, as you can see, I have put a little picture behind me that is a Quebec vineyard, actually, uh, about an hour and a half drive from Montreal right now. Uh, this is a picture from a few years ago. Right now, there's no snow at all. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, <laughs> the the start of the conversation is uh, I think Canada is known when you travel, uh, you're all working in wine. So you know that we make wine in Canada. But if you talk to consumer around the world when I travel, most people don't know that we make wine besides ice wine, because even though Canadians don't drink a lot of ice wine, uh, we export our ice wine mostly to China and the United States. So that is what we are known for. Um, and we make, I'm just going to share a little, um, a, my screen here just to show you the pictures of the wine region in Canada, uh, just to kind of remind you where we make wine in Canada. So uh, you on the eastern, um, the western part, sorry, I'm dyslexic. So the western part, we have British Columbia, uh, where the most important wine region is the Okanagan Valley. Uh, then we have, we make wine in Ontario, we make wine in Quebec, and also uh, Nova Scotia. Um, before I go on to talk about the situation in very different from province to province. The reality in Quebec is very different, for example, than British Columbia. Um, you know, if we look Lisa. at where we are currently uh, in terms of uh, climate change, 
Uh, I'm sure you all read this, that 2023 was the warmest year on record uh, everywhere in the world. Um, and if we look at the PPM, the concentration of, of CO2 in PPM in the atmosphere, in 2019, uh, the PPM um, of CO2 emission was 415. And if we continue to that rate and we don't do anything, by 2060, uh, uh, we'll be above 600 PPM of CO2 in the atmosphere. So what it means as a consequence, as you know, is not global warming, but it's climatic chaos. Um, so that chaos, that's exactly what's been happening in Canada. Uh, I'm sure that if you follow the news in the last year, uh, this summer, uh, you know, for example, in Quebec, uh, in Montreal, where there was flood and rain and, and even growers growing potatoes were struggling in the north of Quebec, we had fires. We It was the first year in history that uh, the entire Canada was burning. So at the same time, we had fires in Nova Scotia, we had fires in Quebec, in Ontario, and in British Columbia. So I had a friend who was driving from British Columbia to Quebec, and she was seeing animals on the road uh, getting out of the forest. That's, uh, I think that's a, a, um, a pretty dramatic situation that we're seeing. So uh, when we think of ice wine, uh, the impact it has on the production of ice wine is different from province to province. Um, I'm going to finish with Ontario because it is the region. Ontario produces the most quantity of ice wine in Canada. And I think there's still a future of ice wine when we think, when we look at the situation in Ontario. Uh, the, it, it's, a, it's a province that still makes a lot of ice wine and can still make a lot of ice wine. I would say that they're probably the least affected right now in terms of climate change. Um, so when we start in British Columbia, uh, British Columbia, uh, I was holding my fourth edition of climate change uh, in Montreal two weeks ago, and I had producers from British Columbia who were there, and it was a pretty dark time because um, they had a really cold spell uh, in January, uh, so much that the buds on the vines are, are dead. So the I was talking to producer three days ago and currently they're looking to help. Uh, they're, they're asking, sorry, they're asking help from the government because most people will lose between 95 and 100% of the crop. 95 to 100 percent of the crop that means that most people will not make any wine at all in 2024 because the buds are dead um in 2022 in british columbia um they had a cold spell a cold vortex in december um and and it actually caused the vine of the trunks to open up so some people had to pull out all the vine and replant entirely the vineyards. So you have to remember, you think of, of, of Canada as cold, but on, on in British Columbia, we have, you know, we used to have a history of hybrids, but from 1990, from 1988, we went back to Vitis vinifera because we knew that we could grow Vitis vinifera successfully. Uh, we don't need geotextile. We don't need healing up uh, because we have cold winter, but not extreme winters. So, you know, even though you have snow and it, it's cold, you don't have minus 22 typically. Um, so British Columbia is planted mostly now with Vitis vinifera. You have the uh, hybrids. So we make ice wine from Vidal. Uh, we have a bit of Marichal Foch, but really what we make the most of is Vitis vinifera. But during those winter freeze that's happening, those Vitis vinifera are not surviving. So obviously, if you're, you, if you're losing your vine uh, or your buds to freeze, to winter freeze, and you're not making any wine, well, there's no ice wine. In 2020, there will not be any 2024 ice wine, that's for sure, because people who will manage to have wine, they will make still wine. Um, the other situation in British Columbia is small, it is fires. So um, it used to be once every other year, you will have fire, now it's every year. Um, 
to give you an idea of the reduction in production due to fire, um, a famous uh, producer called Tantilus Vineyard, one of the first uh, wine producer that Jans has talked about in British Columbia was 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 Tantilus because they have a really old, they have an older uh, vineyard of Riesling, highly recognized. They usually make about 12,000 cases a year. Uh, in 2023, they made 4,000 cases uh, because a high amount of those grapes are lost to smoke taint. Uh, the, they have to, to send the grape, the wine for destination or they don't because it's too highly affected by smoke taint. Um, so obviously, um, that's also a, a reduce in production uh, in terms of the still wine. And what's interesting, though, and that could be explored with when you're looking at solution for uh, smoke taint. I was talking to producer and he was telling me he realizes that um, the problem with smoke taint is the molecule, like au cresol, binds with sugar. So when you make the wine, you know, and you have the wine in the bottle, you don't know when those molecules will unbind. What they're realizing, because of the high sugar content in an ice wine, those molecules don't unbind. So they're thinking, well... <laughs> In the year where we have all of those grapes that are heavily affected by smoke taint, should we leave those grapes on the vines and harvest later to make ice wine? Because we're finding that it's not highly affected by smoke taint. So that's one thing that hasn't been done, but it's they're exploring it because they're realizing that it's not those wines are not affected by smoke taint. Um, the other thing that's happening. Uh, the ideal time usually in British Columbia to pick grapes for ice wine will be late December. You would have a cold spell around, it has to be by law by minus eight, but between minus eight, minus 12, that's when you harvest. The cold spell are coming later and later. So they're coming in January, they're coming in February. So by the time you harvest in mid-January or mid-February, uh, you have problem with desiccation uh, in the grapes. Um, and also you've lost your crops to birds or other animals that are liking those grapes. So uh, the late cold spell mix reduce production as well. So for all of those reasons, we're seeing in British Columbia a difficult future for ice wine. Um, and just to give you a bit of numbers, in 2019 in British Columbia, 15 producers made ice wine in 2023 only three people made ice wine so that's 273 tons of ice wine versus tons in 2023 and it's likely to keep on going like that so the situation in british columbia uh is very different in quebec uh in quebec we don't have a problem with fires um I should have said also in British Columbia, it's a continental climate, but it's extremely, you know, the Okanagan is, is very dry. It's a desert. Um, so you have four uh, distinct uh, season, very dry summer. It's cold in the winter, but not extreme cold as you would have them in Quebec. In Quebec, we have four distinct seasons, so continental climate as well, uh, but winters that are much harder. So that's why we have hybrids mostly planted. Uh, we're planting more and more vitis vinifera because we use geotextile now to protect vines. So we have, uh, you know, uh, geotextile. It's not climate change that's allowing us to have more vitis vinifera. It's the use of geotextile. If you have geotextile and you have um, snow on top of it, uh, it protect. It's like an igloo. So if it could be minus twenty five outside, but it could be only minus 10 or minus 8 underneath. So you don't, the vitis vinifera vine will not be killed. Um, so what's happening with ice wine uh, in Quebec? Well, it, we make uh, most of the wines in the Eastern Township, which is about an hour and 20 minutes from Montreal, just to give you an idea. I was there, I have a cabin there, and over Christmas, usually I ski, it was pouring rain. It was 8 degrees Celsius, it was raining, there's no... Uh, there's no snow. I was there again this weekend, no snow. So uh, 
and it's windy. So there's two things happening is not is you're not getting the the cold spare um that you used to get all the time earning. Uh, you don't know when you're going to get them. And when you do, it's a much shorter window um, and it's happening later. So right now, like we've had like a rainy Christmas season. Uh, we've had a really cold spell for a week in, the, in January, but today it's two degrees Celsius. And that's where it should be the coldest. So the strong winds that are happening and also later, um, later cold spell, same situation a little bit in British Columbia, where you have desiccation of the grape. Um, so the result of this is we have less and less people who want to make it because it's just too much risk. It's uh, you're leaving the grapes a long time, hoping that it's going to happen. And if it does happen, it will be late and the quality of the grape is not the same. Uh, so right now, ice wine in Quebec represents less than 1% of the production. So very little. Um, in 2019, we had seven people who harvested uh, grapes uh, to make ice wine, vin de glace, as we say in French. In 2022, uh, two people. Um, and in 2023, likely to have two to three people. So uh, there is an abandon of, uh, of, of making ice wine uh, in um, in Quebec, and I, you know, if you talk to someone like uh, Charles Henri at Leur Paillard, who've been making ice wine for 27 years, he's very passionate because it is the signature a little bit of Canada. That is the one thing that we kind of make throughout Canada that we're known for. Um, but it's becoming a highly financial risk. Um, so people are not willing to take that risk, and uh, especially that it's mostly for export, and local people want to drink still wine so you're just going to make your still wine from your grapes and there's less risk associated associated to it um ontario is having hope though uh, ontario gives us hope that we will continue to that's how i'm going to finish on a high note it's it, it's giving us hope that we will continue to make uh, ice wine they have been experiencing they have not experienced the same situation uh than uh, quebec or british columbia um, if you if you look at the production, it is true that the production as is changing a lot from year to year, but it's not due to climate change. Uh, the the change in production is due to demand. So the biggest export market was the U.S. and China. So the the political situation with China right now is making it harder. So people are if they know that they won't sell it to the main market they're harvesting the grapes to make still wine because they don't know that they're going to have a market. Um, and um, and also if like in 2022, pe most people had a smaller harvest. So if you have a smaller harvest, um, you're likely to make those, use those grapes for still wine rather than leaving it out for ice wine. So that is the main reason why we're having a fluctuation in terms of quantity in Ontario. So it's not related to climate change because uh, currently you will see, if you talk to producers who've been making um, ice wine for a long time in Ontario, they will tell you that yes, you know, they, they are har the, the change of harvest, the window is changing a little bit, but it's not dramatic. It's not like, oh, we're seeing a month difference and it's not really even in, in 2018 people were harvesting in November uh, but most of the times you keep on harvesting between mid to late December and mid January so there hasn't been a big change in that regard um, and it's it's also dependent on the type of grape that you have because if you have for example Vidal which is a hybrid that people use a lot for ice wine it's a, it's a lot more resilient. It's, you know, the grape is more resilient and you don't have as much uh, desiccation as you would have with other type of grapes. Uh, Cabernet Franc is also very successful for the same reason. You don't have as much desiccation as other grapes. But if you, if you try with Syrah, it's more complicated because there's more desiccation. So um, it's, it's related to the type of grape you're using. Um, 
but if you continue to use Vidal and Cabernet Franc, which are very popular, and even Riesling, if you talk to people like Stratus, for example, which they use uh, Riesling, um, they haven't seen a change in quality or um, uh, or any issues in making ice wine. Um, so to conclude, Canada will continue to make ice wine. Ontario has been making, has always been the, the, the province who makes the most ice wine. And I think uh, this will continue uh, to be, uh, um, I don't think that it's, there's any uh, concern of whether Ontario will continue to make ice wine related to climate. However, I think it's more related to, do we have the market to sell those wines to? Um, so I think we all have a role <laughs> to encourage. And I think, you know, it's every country makes something unique uh, when it comes to wine. And I think it's something that's besides Germany and Canada, there's not that many countries who still make ice wine. So I think we have to to make uh, our part to save those style of wine that are so unique. Um, but we're less likely to see ice wine from Quebec and British Columbia uh, in the future years. Thank you very much, Michelle. That was that was a, a huge tour of a huge place. Thank you so much for that. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I, we don't have any immediate questions, so I think we should just take questions perhaps at the end. If people want to drop them in the chat, you you that was a big a big survey and covering a lot of ground. Um, so I think we should move on to Monica. Okay. Uh, Monica, if you'd like to unmute and. Okay. Um... Thank Andrea, you. how how are, are we going to do this? Are you going to show my presentation or? Yes, I can switch on. Just let me know when you'd like me to start. Okay, okay. I just say oh, next one then. Okay, okay well, let's, let's start. I'll start it on now. Yeah. Sorry, I had some problems with my computer. Is that okay? Okay, so. Hello, everybody. Um, now it's my turn to talk a little bit about ice wine production in uh, Germany. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of snow, which unfortunately we do not see very often anymore. Uh, so things have also changed over here. And uh, I think, as Michelle already said, that can really create some problems in, in some regions there. So next, please. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the background of ice wine. What are the characteristics? How is climate change impacting um, our ice wine production? Also a little bit about some regulation, the market. And then I will go more into the technical part about harvest, pressing, uh, the fermentation, and so on. So as you can see, we have um, a delayed harvest normally until winter. And then normally uh, we do a hand picking. It's illegal here to use a mechanical harvester for ice wine. So we have to do a hand picking, which means that when you finish that you have def to defrost yourself for at least a day because it gets really, really cold there. And then we crush the grapes and we do um, the fermentation later on. And then after some time, also the bottling. Next, please. I think what is very important here to know is that ice wine, of course, is a naturally sweet wine or dessert wine, but there are differences to other products. You know, there's something like Sauterne or TBA, Trockenbeer Auslese, Tokai, Varsanto. And here they all have different um, characteristics. They have different methods of production. For ice wine, it's frozen grapes and then pressed under low temperature or at least uh, below zero degrees. For Sauterne, you know, use but, uh, botrytis berries, also for TBA and for Tokai. And this is the issue here. This is very important. In Germany, you need to get a so-called AP number, some, an approval number that this product is okay, which means it has to go to an analytical test, but also a sensory test. And it's absolutely not accepted that these ice wines show any kind of botrytis in there. So that means it's really, really complicated because we have to wait very long uh, to be able to pick the grapes there. And under the current conditions out there, which means it's very warm um, and humid, 
it's very rarely that you really can keep healthy sound grapes out in the vineyards for a longer period of time. So this year also, like Michelle said, it's very difficult. We had on, around Christmas, we had 10 degrees plus. Uh, we had a lot of rain and then in end, uh, middle of June, uh, middle of January, actually it was so cold that even Frankfurt airport uh, closed down, shut down completely, which never happens normally. And, um, but by then, you know, there are not great, no grapes out there anymore. You really have to go into a very high risk to be able to keep grapes in a condition out in the vineyards that you can make a good ice wine from that. And of course, the varieties here for us mainly is Riesling, but sometimes also other uh, varieties. But again, normally we use Riesling. And as you know, in the, in the overview here, as you can see for Sautern and uh, other products, here, they use the, the local varieties as well. Next one, please. So this is actually taken from, from Canada because I couldn't find anything from Germany. And I also have to mention that this is a presentation from two of my master students who were also very interested in, uh, in ice wine and they allowed me to use this. So here you can see for Canada, at least in January, it was cold enough in some years. You see here's the average from 1970 to 2007 to really um, harvest um, frozen grapes. In Germany, I think in the last 10 years, there were maybe two vintages where in some regions it was cold enough. So that means we really have a problems with reaching the temperature in order to make an ice wine, a really good ice wine at least. So normally we say that at harvest, the temperature must be minimum minus eight degrees, but in some areas they demand that it's minus 10 degrees and minus 10 is not happening very often anymore. So this is really a big, big issue. And uh, Michelle, you were talking about skiing, and I know that in some areas in the Alps, they're already talking about what else they could offer to their tourists because they have no snow anymore. So that's a, that's a big, big problem there. Next one, please. So of course there are definitions for that. In, in the OIV, the definition is, Wine, ice wine is a wine made exclusively from the fermentation of fresh grapes having undergone a, a cryoselection in the vineyard without using any physical procedures. Um, and the grapes must be used for the production of ice wine must be frozen during the harvest and be pressed in this state. That was a very interesting discussion because at the very beginning, it only said this ice wine is the product which is made from frozen, uh, made from uh, berries or grapes frozen on the vine in the vineyard. And then there were some smart guys saying, okay, great, then we use some uh, liquid nitrogen and we can produce uh, Palm Springs ice wine. And then we said, no, 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 that's not possible. Uh, so without the use of any physical procedure, so no technical support. But that really meant it's, um, that really meant it's uh, not legal to use any, let's say, artificial freezing uh, possibilities there. But what I also have to mention is that some people now started discussing the question of what is a technical support? Is netting already a technical support? Is, you know, when you just put a net out there or when you use plastic folies, is that a technical support? And when you close the plastic folie at the, at the bottom, which is, you know, problematic in particular for the birds, but then some of the grapes will be falling into this plastic. Are you allowed to use them? Question mark. There is some discussion about this. And of course, at this stage, nobody would throw them away, but this is, um, this is happening and definitely under discussion. So harvesting and pressing, as I said, it should be lower than minus seven, some areas uh, even lower than that. And then here we have the additional, um, yeah, the additional restriction that the sugar content, which you will reach after the pressing, has to be at least the quality of a Bärenauslese, a BA. So if you have lower sugar concentration, it's nothing. It's not a, it's not a, 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 a Spätlese, it's not an Auslese. 
it's nothing because it was frozen. It's not fresh grapes coming from the vineyards. And that's another risk out there. So having the right temperature to freeze it down effectively to the sugar concentration you need to have, plus having sound grapes, which are not affected by any botrytis and have not been eaten by any birds or wild boars. That is even a bigger problem here. So, and also, of course, the volatile acidity has to be um, lower than that. And maximum sugar, uh, sorry, maximum SO2 is 400 milligrams, which you normally do not really need. Next one, please. So this is, uh, again, shows you what already uh, Michelle showed you, some of the regions where uh, we can produce ice wine. And here in Europe, it's mainly in Germany, Austria, a little bit in the Czech Republic, Slovenia, Croatia, and also in some areas where it can get cooler. But in Croatia, this is even worse than compared to Germany. And also in Hungary, Slovakia, very often, it's actually not cold enough. But as was already pointed out, it's a very big market. You know, there are very expensive wines there. And when you look at the, the size, the market size and the value, here we have uh, quite a bit. And uh, so the prediction is that it will grow if we can continue um, to even higher, um, higher yeah, market value there. Next one, please. So this is what that was also already mentioned. I could not find that for, for Germany, but China is a very famous market for, for, um, for ice wine in United States and then Hong Kong, Korea, United Kingdom and so on. And actually it was quite funny when you ever have a chance to be in Honolulu, there is a, a store which only sells ice wine. So I thought that was really funny. And they told me, I asked them, why is it only ice wine? And they said, well, so many people from Asian countries are coming there on their honeymoon. And for them, it's a specialty to buy some ice wine there. So I thought, well, having a shop in Honolulu, which is not the cheapest place on earth, and only selling ice wine, this is <laughs> quite something. So next one, please. <clears throat> so this is very important, what I already mentioned before. So. As I said, we need to use some sort of netting that might be open nets, but also some plastic. And then we have to wait until it's cold enough. And then ideally the temperature should be somewhere 10 to minus 13 degrees. And when you look at the temperature and the sugar concentration here in the same berries, you can see when we harvest at minus six, we have about 29% sugar in there. And when we go down with the temperature, you can see that the sugar concentration is going up. If we harvest at minus 14 degrees, we have a sugar concentration of 56. And this is what I said before, you have to achieve the sugar concentration at least of a Bernhaus laser. So you have to have the right temperature because if again, the sugar concentration is too low, it's nothing, you cannot use it for, for anything. And this is a, yeah, as I said, this is a really a very big risk. But it also means that here, when you have higher sugar concentration, you have lower quantity, you have a lower volume. So it's again, a balance between, you know, some econo economy questions, and on the other side, the quality question is, you know, wh where's the cut? How far can you go? And next one, next slide, please, I can show you what I mean. Here you can see frozen uh, grapes out there with just here. You, maybe you can recognize there's some sort of netting there here. And uh, this is sort of accepted. But again, then the birds would come and they would pick here and cause some damage. And uh, therefore, very often now plastic is, is used. But Again, the definition is that already some sort of technical support there. And of course, during that time of the year, these berries are very attractive, not only for, for birds, but also for all kinds of animals, in particular the vineyards, which are a little bit closer to, to some forests, they are very often in, in some danger there. So they are using some technology, so sometimes some fires or some, some sort of noises they use to shock the birds. Um, that can also some chemical bird repellent or some robotic laser bird repellent. So different, different things which they might be using. But of course, that makes it even more expensive to produce this kind of wine. So the risk there 
is extremely high. And I think here we have our own winery at the university. So we are a VDP member and we have 36 hectares. So we work as a commercial winery there as well. And the last ice wine we made was uh, 1993. So that's quite a while. No, sorry, 94, 94. So next one, please. So this is how it looks like. You have to go out there and, uh, and do the harvesting by hand, and then you have to do the pressing. And then, of course, this looks like a very solid block. <laughs> it takes a couple of days before it really completely defrosts. Um, but the question is, how far can you go with the defrosting there? So how much of the ice water do you want to let go into the juice in order to be somehow in a balance between quality, but also having enough uh, quantity there? And this is always uh, a question of the producer, how far they can go, as long as they are still in the sugar concentration, which they need to have in order to call it ice wine. The pressing, of course, takes a long time, normally several hours. And very often we also put the press outside to keep it cold. Um, and then normally we use a, a basket press and the yield of pressing is somewhere around 10 to 15%, which again is very, very low. So next one, please. This is one of the presses, you know, the basket press, because you really need to have quite a bit of of, of, of pressure there. Uh, so we go from 50 to about 350 bars. And then, you know, we let it sit. And again, you have to be careful because when you put it in, <clears throat> excuse me, into the normal press house and where it might be warm because of the people working there, there's more of the ice, which will be defrosting. And when you put it outside, then of course you can keep it at cooler temperatures and you might end up with higher sugar concentration, but lower quantities. This is always, you know, you know, where you have to make, this is the cut, you know, how far can you go? Next one, please. So, but then we go into the next problem, and this is the fermentation issue. We have such high sugar concentrations in the, in the mass then, that the osmotic pressure on the yeast is very high. And osmotic pressure means that you know, in the, the sugar concentration tries to, wants to get diluted, let's put it that way. And they are kind of soaking out the water out of the, of the yeast cells so that the yeast itself has a problem to do a really good fermentation there. And at a certain point, it's a little bit, I don't want to say toxic for the yeast, but it's a little bit like, I, I always say to my students, I mean, if you like black uh, forest uh, cake and uh, you have it once in a while, it's nice. But when you have to eat it in the morning for lunch and for dinner, um, then it's not so nice anymore. And this is pretty much what we offer to the yeast, something extremely sweet. And when you reach a, a certain alcohol concentration plus the sugar, then the yeast says, I finish, I can't continue anymore, I'm sick. So, and uh, this is a little bit the problem what, what we see here. So, and also we get very often a little bit of higher concentration of some acidic acid, uh, which needs to be in, in balance also with the formation of glycerol. Um, the result very often is that we have smaller sized and stressed yeast cells and the slower fermentation and the higher concentration of glycerol and also acetic acid, which is accepted, you know, which is a uh, part of uh, an ice wine style. Next one, please. So what's also a big issue is how to clarify, to filter and to stabilize these products because this is like liquid honey and any kind of, um, of, of fining material is rather complicated because you never know is it going to does it stick inside the the, the 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 wine or can we take it out and they have tried a lot of different um, fining materials starting with bentonite with soybean proteins they use membrane filtration they use centrifugation and uh, here of course in china they are also making ice wines now and uh, they then it, it checked uh, the impact on the clarity 
the, physio the physiochemical indexes, the aroma quantity, the quality, and also the sensory characteristics. And in general, I can tell you, it is very, very hard to, to do the, the defining of these products and then also the filtration. We have one of these big um, filter units where we just put it in and it, it drops out over a couple of days before we really have a good end result there. And uh, that again is another problem there. Next one, please. So far, they have not really seen that there is a, a very big influence on, I don't want to go into detail here, but you know, some of these things um, are here, you can see uh, that the red one is the control and then was the bentonite, the centrifugation and, and so on. So I wouldn't say that it's too big of a difference there. So it's it was not really significant, um, but somehow you have to get it clean because our consumers really don't like some um, sort of, let's say, milky ice wines there because they're always afraid there might be something in there which is not so so good for their, for their health. So, you know, we have to get a clean product there. Next one, please. So then, of course, the question is how to age. Some people said, OK, let's try uh, aging on the lees, you know, like we do that for some the batonage thing that you stir up the yeast. But it was not so positive because, as I said, the yeast is, is stressed because of the conditions there. And of course, they do release some monoproteins, which create a little bit of bigger mouse feel there. But we already have a, a mouse feel there because it's a very sweet product with a lot of glycerol in there. So aging on the lease was actually not so positive as we thought it, it might be. Uh, some people believe it can protect some of the fruitiness but and preserve some of the variety the variety of aromas, but we were not so so happy to be honest about the, the quality of that. So uh, batonage, I really like for Rieslings, even uh, with when you keep it on, not on the, on the full yeast, but just the fine yeast, but for ice wine, it's definitely nothing I would really recommend. So next one, please. And also the question of uh, how to, to age it. Should we put that in, in, uh, in barrels? Um, there might be then, depending on the, the air conditioning in the cellar, uh, there might be even a higher loss of, of volume there because some of the water might be still evaporating. So you get some sort of concentration in there. Um, people have noticed that the acidity gets a little bit softer by the um, barrel aging, but on the other side, high acidity can protect the product when you have a, a long, um, yeah, when you're expecting a long lifespan for the products because there are products which normally are not consumed at a very uh, young stage but a little bit yeah, older so for christmas we had a 1983 ice wine which was fabulous so i believe me that are products which are really really nice then um yeah also when you're using uh, barriques you get additional flavor in there like the the buttery characteristics sometimes the vanilla which is not always uh, accepted for, for ice wine because they are more living from the honey characters in there and from the very, how should I say, um, um, concentrated fruit aromas, which can be, you know, there can be some sort of an overlayer by the um, by barrix there. Next one. And for the big barrels, of course, normally you don't have uh, enough volume to fill up a big barrel. I mean, if we had that, wonderful. We keep it in our stainless steel tanks because then we can, we have one where you can move the, the, the lid so that it's always full. And uh, that's what we do. And here's also some literature if you want to take another look. And again, this was a presentation by our master students and uh, in advanced enology and uh, my special thanks go to them. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica and Michelle, both. Um, and especially for providing some literature at the end to refer to for future reading. Uh, that was incredibly edifying. I had no idea about the complexity 
I did know about some of the laws, but I had no idea about the complexity. And especially I found interesting how the sugar concentrates the colder it gets, which yeah. is somewhat counterintuitive. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, and perhaps I, I'm not sure which which of you would prefer to take these, but the first one was from Michelle Shaw, principally about the origins of ice wine, its history, mm. which as I understand is not actually fairly long. Michelle, would you like to, Michelle Shaw, would you like to unmute and? Um, thanks, Meg. Yes, and thank you both very much. That was fascinating. Probably my questions indicate how little I know about ice wine. So I was just wondering, you know, when was it established as a, as a category? And what historical data is there that sort of um, testifies to its um, existence? Uh, and um, where was it first, you know, um, developed? Was it Germany or I suppose Europe or Canada? So uh, there are a few questions in one. So thank you. I don't know who would like to answer that. I'll start with the dates in Canada and America. You probably can continue with uh, with Germany, but in Canada, um, the the first ice wine was made in British Columbia in 1978, and then Ontario in 1984. Um, I suspect that uh, Germany was before that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, I can't tell you exactly what date it was, but you know. Here in 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 Geisenheim we have uh, Johannesburg Castle, which is quite famous, and there they uh, sort of invented, discovered late harvest, and that was uh, because at the time that was a monastery, and whenever they wanted to start harvest, they had to get the permission from the top monastery, which was quite a distance away, and one of the monks got a little bit delayed by returning for whatever reason. And the grapes looked pretty rotten already, and they were quite devastated. And said, "Oh my God, no wine this year!" But they made it, and they discovered that it was a wonderful product. So late harvest, and I think that ice wine was probably invented the same way. Oh, so that it was my guess. One, one big mistake. <laughs> yeah, a wonderful mistake. No? <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank and, you. For... Uh, I, uh, late harvest. That was more than two hundred years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you for that um, history. Uh, Lawrence also had a question about market and demand, international demand, especially in light of how we are, it's it's hard to sell sweet wine these days in a lot of areas. Lawrence, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Um, first of all, I'd like to commend Monica and the team for that description of well, how yeast copes with or struggles in such a high concentration sugar solution. My question is about what is driving the projected increase in sales in one of the earlier of Monica's slides. Given that when I've been doing my studies for the WSET diploma, everything I read talks about reduced demand for sweet wines. You know, the, there's the health aspect, there's a reduction in people consuming sugar. And I'm just wondering if Monica knows or has got a clue and any idea what, what's going to drive that increase in demand. I'm not quite sure that I understood your question, but you were asking about the, the sugar concentration in the well, juice that, that, and then the, the impact on the yeast. No, I was complimenting you on the description of the uh, oh. sugar concentration. My question is, in one of your earlier slides, you showed a quite significant increase in the projected sales of ice wines. And um, I can't remember the exact time period. And I was wondering what's driving that potential increase in sales, the background being we seem to be more and more concerned about sugar consumption uh, and health and, and, and a general lack of, dare I say it, reduction of interest in drinking sweet wines. Yeah. I like them, but lots of others don't. Yeah. Um, I think that ice wine is still something very special for, for special occasions. And that many consumers say, okay, a one-time thing for whatever occasion, that's fine as long as I don't drink it on a regular basis. Right. Um, we see the problem, the issue right now with low alcohol products with uh, no sugar or low sugar concentrations in there. But I think that ice wine is something very special on the side. Like people would also, let's say, eat foie gras <laughs> one time, two times a year. 
I would like to do that more often, but uh, so the combination of ice wine and foie gras would be wonderful. But I think it's an exemption there that they say, okay, for a very special event, for special occasion, I do that. And you know, the, the quantity behind it, the quantity that they are drinking is, n is not so high compared to a regular wine. Okay, I also think that gifting, right? It's a lot of ice wine is purchased for, for gift. Yes. So gift, gifting is is a big thing with ice wine. So yeah. that's fun function of the tourism trade, possibly. Mm. My father always said, "This is where where wine starts." So he, he didn't care about the sugar concentration. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Lawrence, for that question. Uh, Neil pointed out uh, that in Oregon, where he lives and, and writes and works from, there are very few winemakers who are making, or none, uh, to his knowledge, who are making uh, naturally uh, cryo-concentrated wines. However, um, and I'm familiar with this as well, having worked for a California winery that, that made a wine they called Vin de Glaciere, as opposed to Vin yes. de Glaciere. Yes, Bonnie Dune. <laughs> Bonnie Dune Vineyard. Yes. Um, the, 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 the addressing the question of cryo concentration, which I understand is illegal in Germany, um, can can either of you, uh, and Neil, please chime in if you have anything further to, to say on, on your comment there, but could you, either of you have anything to, to add about that? Well, just it's something that's quite discussed right now in Quebec, actually, uh, for the reason that Monica was sharing. Uh, but if you sell a nice wine under appellation, cryo extraction is, is not permitted uh, so you can do it but you won't have an appellation on the label mm -hmm. um, it's it has to be frozen uh, on the vine yeah there are parts in France where they are using it uh, but they are not calling it cryo concentration they are calling it cryo selection and they're not calling the product ice wine yeah. so here yeah. it's illegal because they are very afraid of so so-called fake ice wines mm -hmm. but um, I, even under the current problems with climate change i cannot see that they would change the, the law because then ice wine is even more exclusive uh, mm -hmm. and even more rare and even more uh, expensive, expensive. But i don't think they they will change that yeah, it's this. I think here in, in Quebec, I know that it was a producer asking because we have a big history of cider, uh, ice cider production, and it's always been a, an issue with cider where there were people leaving the apple on the trees versus freezing uh, artificially the apple. Uh, and so we have a long history with that, but people are really fighting to keep ice wine with uh, grapes. Um, frozen on the vines and not yeah. permitted yeah. like Rio. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Heather Doherty had a question about pressing and the press cycle. Heather, would you like to pose your question to our experts? Yes, hi. This might be me showing my ignorance here, but I was just thinking if you're, um, you've got your frozen grapes that you've harvested and you've got them in the press, I mean, the, the longer you leave them in the press, potentially they're going to start warming up and some of that ice is going to go into your juice. So is that regulated at all or is that just a question of what the winemaker feels is acceptable? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, you know, you ha normally have to use a basket press because of the pressure you need. And compared to a tank press, you cannot tumble, you know, and, and then it just increase the pressure a little bit. That doesn't work. Um, this is what I said before. You have to have at least the sugar concentration of a Bernhaus lazy here, of a BA. And this is this is minimum. And this is where the winemaker always, you know, is a little bit of sort of internal conflict, how far to go uh, to get enough volume. But on the other side, also preserving the, the quality there. So quantity versus quality, that makes it so complicated. And as long as you still have the sugar concentration of a BA, it's okay. Okay. So there is a there is a sort of baseline, but that after that, it's up to the winemaker. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. And there are some people in Canada using pneumatic press actually to, to make it. Um, mm -hmm. So the history has been basket press, but now there are people using a pneumatic press. Really? Um, How hmm, often do they have to replace like the membrane? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very good question. <clears throat> but you, you know, it forms like a big block of ice because when you when you harvest the grapes, uh, it's it really becomes a huge block of ice. So it's yeah. it can remain yeah. frozen like yeah. for many days. Like okay. a producer was saying, you know, for the basket press, it took him over 70 hours. It was still a block of ice. Mm. And so it's very, very slow. So you're not um it's it's not so much a concern. Okay. Thank you. I was told that in the old days when it was a little bit cooler here, um, ice wine was not so rare. And that very often when, you know, they really pressed it for, for having the ice wine, they let it uh, start melting and the the wineries or the, the vintners, they use that for themselves to make some sort of own <laughs> wine for at home. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Interesting. Uh, we don't have any further questions. Um, I just want to, there's a few more minutes here if we have any further things to add or to discuss. Um, Anyone else? I wanted to add something that Monica said in terms of the future in, in Canada. Um, I think that, you know, you have your roles in Germany for the Bihanash Lese, but here I think uh, it's influencing the style because uh, when we have the cold vortex, it's much colder. So the before we used to have that window of 8 minus 10, but now the window that we have often, the temperature is much colder if we do get that window. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're saying uh, it's you know some wine maker is not like that because it's making a much sweeter highly concentrated ice wine and so the style when we do have cold spell it's making a more concentrated style that we used to have because it's always much yeah. colder yeah so it's either not cold enough or too or very cold yeah yeah so as, as is common with most discussions of climate change, the, the results are it's complicated, right? It can make things easier, it can make things yeah. harder, it can it's make very things complicated. not sweet enough. So it's really, we should really think about climate chaos, I guess, when we think about it. I think it will be more complicated in the future. And for, for us, at yeah. least here, our problem is not so much the increasing temperature, because I think that... Of course, that is an issue, but the problem is that we have um, variability here, which is close to 100%. So it can be yeah. extremely cold and extremely hot or extremely wet and extremely dry. The only thing what really stays constant is extremely, you know, and that makes it so, so difficult exactly. to really, you know, continue with this. Yeah, it's the same thing. I think it's the one thing that's common throughout all the wine regions of the world yeah. is yeah. the extremes are different, but everyone is experiencing extreme and that's yeah. Yeah. difficult. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much. And on that very disappointing, dispiriting note, <laughs> <laughs> it was a really fascinating conversation and many people are weighing into the chat to thank you for this uh, best presentation on best explanation of ice wine ever is one direct quote, for example. Uh, so thank you very much. And I don't know if Michelle, if you'd like to add anything and otherwise we can turn it over. Um, yes, well, I'd like to also thank very much. Um, uh, it was absolutely fascinating. And now I will certainly search for a bottle of ice wine somewhere and put that in my cellar. Yes. <laughs> but, um, 